Welcome back. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. I'm trying to get this out to more people as my journey progresses. And that's the only way that YouTube helps you out and puts you in front of more people. I'm not trying to make money. I'm just trying to spread good karma, help other people not make the mistakes I make. We're on day three of this carnivore, gone carnivore journey. What I do on day three? Well, still trying to cook that meat, still haven't been successful, so I said, well, I need a kitchen thermometer, one of them ultra-fast kitchen thermometers so you can stick in meat, and you can get them at the local stores and they're not too bad because it's going to take me a while to get the meter block that I ordered on day two to get here into Thailand. So I ordered one, of, or I went out and got one of the cooking thermometers. And I went online, I decided, I'm going to order a sous vide cooker, a circulating cooker that cooks sous vide. And sous vide is spelled S-O-U-V-I-D-E. Some people have heard of it. Some people have never heard of it. But basically, the principle is you can cook it in water and you put it in a vacuum bag or a sealed bag, plastic. You submerge it in water and this cooker, the circulator, precisely controls the temperature of the water and if it's done in an hour but you cooked it three hours you really have a tough time telling the difference so long as it brings up the internal temperature of the steak for medium rare I've been running around 55 to 56 degrees Celsius and the water will bring the steak up to that temperature, but if the water is 100 and or if the water is 55 degrees Celsius and the steak's submerged in the water surrounded by it, it's not going to get any higher than 55 degrees Celsius. You could leave the thing in there for a week. What you would do is eventually you would be breaking it down, breaking the enzymes down. But I had a sous vide cooker when I lived in Cincinnati. And I used it to make barbecued ribs. I would go to Costco and get the uncooked rack of ribs, pork ribs, and I would come back and season them, put them in a vacuum sealed bag using a food saver vacuum sealer. And I used to put them in the sous vide system that I had, which that was different. It wasn't a circulator that works on a like container of water. This was like a crock pot. And it was a sous vide uh, big crock pot. You could put a rack of ribs in there. And you'd set it to a temperature, and I might cook those ribs for 18, 12 hours. Now, they could be done in three. But if you sous vide them for like 12 or 18, depending on what you wanted and the temperature you set, I eventually had to a point where when you open the ribs up, they were like the ribs at the Wedge Inn. Now, for those people who didn't live in Cincinnati, the Wedge Inn's a little bitty hole-in-the-wall bar on Corrine Avenue, south of Galbraith. It was owned by a man named Ron Cook. And old Ron, he cooked ribs. In fact, he did catering. I later found out that he only bought his ribs from a single supplier in Indianapolis. 
I met that man by accident when I was selling one of my guitars to leave the United States and come to Thailand. The man came in and it happened to be on a Wednesday. Now, Ron cooked ribs and served ribs at his little small bar every Wednesday. And those ribs, when you get a rack of ribs, you could reach down, grab the bone, lift up on the bone, and the meat stayed on the plate if you were grabbed in the middle. That's just how tender it was. And he did what he called parboiling, which I think meant sous vide and under pressure. So I used to cook my ribs that way. I recommended this guy. I said, yes, if you're all the way here from Indianapolis, you ought to drive about two miles down this way and get some of these ribs on Wednesday. You've never had finer ribs than at the Wedge Inn. He said, well, I sell the ribs every Every rib he ever cooks it comes from me. I sell them out of Indianapolis and, and sell them to Ron, and he buys all his ribs from me. So he knew all about it, and he came all the way from Indianapolis to Cincinnati. So I had a sous vide cooker. Of course, I left it back in the United States. So on day three, I ordered this sous vide circulator. And now that we're in a pool villa, with tons of room. I mean, if you look behind me, I know it's a little blurry because that's the way this camera is set up with the, the type of prime lens that's on it that sort of gives bokeh to the background. But uh, if you learn how to do sous vide right, you can get tender. You can get tender if you want to cook it long enough and if you cook it at the right temperature. Sorry, day three, the only thing I did was I got a fast cooking or fast acting thermometer that I could poke into meat. I ordered the sous vide circulator. I was just about out of the macro meat, but I kept trying. I tried every which way I could to cook this stuff, but I didn't have sous vide, that's for sure. And all I had was sore teeth and a headache. So... I ate other stuff other than those steaks, which is, I love steaks, wish I could have stayed on, but if you're going to go on this journey, sous vide is worth looking into for sure. Now, I could get into, and maybe someday I will, but I could get into saying this is how you sous vide, and this is what it's all about, and this is what it looks like, and that. But there are so many channels on YouTube that will technically show you how to sous vide. There are channels, one was called Sous Vide Everything. And this guy's got like over a million subscribers. And he's done all these experiments and all these how-tos and all these comparisons. I mean, I just watched a comparison the other day where he took and cut four ribeyes out of the same exact piece of meat, and then he froze them all, and then he did an experiment where one of them he put in the refrigerator for 24 hours out of the freezer to frost. One of them he brought up and only put in the refrigerator for one hour to defrost partially. One of them he put in a bowl of cold water to defrost right before he was ready to cook it. And one of them he sous vide straight out of the freezer ice cold as a block of a rock. And of course he has all his cohort, cohort, cohort buddies. <laughs> I was trying to say the word is spelled C-O-H-O-R-T-S, but I guess we'll go with buddies. How's that? Uh, he has his buddies come in after he's done, and they all cut them open and look, and then they do the taste test and tell him which ones that tasted better than the other ones. So I'm not going to get into, you know, the 
true technical in the weeds on a lot of things. But I'm going to tell you the difficulties I had. And I guess the main takeaway is from day one, don't buy your frickin' meat at macro. At least not all of it. Especially not the thin steaks that they end up serving you that come from Australia. Well, here we have some homeless dogs down the street near the ice plant. At least we think they're homeless because they just hang out on the street all day. So we decided the best use for a micro steak was to take it down and give it to the homeless dogs. Now these were ribeyes. However, if you notice how polite these dogs are, none of these dogs try to take somebody else's food. They just all sit there very politely. They're not rushing Noi, and they're just waiting their turn, and they're, they're just happy to be getting some ribeyes. So, great. Mm -hmm. oh. Delicious steak, I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Delicious steak you do. Yeah. Yes, no doubt about it. All done. And this is... Wagyu beef from Australia. It says it's Wagyu. It's got all kinds of fat lines in it. Uh, it looked good. It looked thin, but it looked good, but I couldn't cook it for shit. So, day three is over with. Stay tuned for more. That's all, folks.